Now let's see if we can get any mathematical idea of why this gives a sharp spectral peak. R squared, let's write it, 2R squared, 1 minus cosine delta, I just pulled the 2 out, why not, over R to the fourth minus R squared, 2 cosine delta, or minus 2R squared cosine delta. Uh, plus one, of course, just to complicate things, plus one. There we go. So it's hard to see anything useful there. CSA, you use cosine delta equals one minus two sine squared delta over two. Okay, so that's not anything to do with our physics, that is just uh, a trig identity. And now, 10 steps, you've seen me do enough algebra, you don't want to watch me do more algebra. I'm going to write down the answer. You can actually get it to a form that looks like this, and to see intuitively what happens in cases like this, it's always good to get it with as many ones as you can, okay? So you can get it down to one over r squared minus one squared over four r squared sine squared delta over two. Plus one, all right? And then this is sort of useful because it can start to give you some idea of why this would make a sharp function. And to figure it out, I need to write it where I can actually get to it. So here we go, let me write it one more time. One over uh, r squared minus one squared over 4r squared sine squared delta over 2. Okay, so this is always 1. This is always 1. And let's start to think about what these things do. So we're thinking about this sharp spectral feature you get when r is almost 1. Let's say r equals you know, 0.99 or something, really high reflection coefficient. If that's the case, then this is going to be almost zero, right? If this is 0.99, you square it, it's still very close to one. One minus one is almost zero, zero, something almost zero squared is almost zero. So that's very small, that's almost zero. So if that's zero in the numerator, then it's probably some number in the denominator. Let's look at this. This oscillates um, between zero and one, it's a sine squared. So if we started varying that phase, varying the wavelength, say, this would just go up and down sine squared. And then what is this? So this is about four, right? Because r is very close to one, r squared is very close to one, so that is very close to four. So we have something that looks like zero or something that looks like four times this sine squared delta over two, plus one and all over one, okay? So when this whole thing when this is roughly zero, then r is just one, right? So if we were to plot uh, r versus this delta, right? It's gonna be one a lot of the time. It's gonna be one whenever this whole term is zero, and it has a zero in the numerator, so it likes to be zero. Now, you'll notice though, when the sine squared goes to zero, suddenly your denominator goes to zero, right? So if the denominator goes to zero, this term becomes infinity, right? Because this isn't quite zero, this is almost zero. That sine squared goes to exactly zero, okay? Sine squared goes to exactly zero. I don't care how small this is, it's infinity. One over infinity plus one is one over infinity, and it's zero. So it gets to zero, and then maybe it goes back to one. So the question is what makes it sharp, okay? Why is it like this? rather than like that. What makes it sharp? Is it just because the sine is squared? No, it's not just because the sine is squared. That only doubles the, the frequency or the, the rate of change with uh, something. Uh, but then we have delta over two, so that goes away. Okay, here's the reason. Is when you look at this, let's say you come off the zero just a little bit, okay? If you come off the zero a little bit, you're basically, say you go, you know, from zero to point one, okay? You're from zero to point one, you got a four up here. 
So your 0.1 is still of the order of 0.1. It's actually up by a factor of 4. Your 0.1 becomes 0.4. But if this is like 0.999 or something, right? 0.99 squared, I don't know, it's 0.98 something. But this might be like 0 0.01, OK? So if this moves just a little bit off phase, but has already gone to 0 0.4, 0 0.01 over 0 0.4 is still really small. So it's very quickly gone all the way back. If this is really small, it's 1 over 1 again. It very quickly makes its way back up here. Okay? So it only cancels. It only gives you the denominator of 0. It only has, it don't, this term only gets big to make this happen. And it, the effect goes away because this is like a really a much smaller number than this. That's basically the reason. So when this gets off the condition that cancels just right, it remains small because this is is sort of a couple is orders of magnitude, factor of 100 or something below that, depending on how big R is. So you can kind of see it in here. Okay. Now you may be looking at this equation and saying, "Oh wait, he wrote that upside down. That's wrong," because you may be thinking about the different uh, devices that do this. Okay. So. This is the real amazing thing in this optics class is I'm not going to really talk about all the devices that do this. So we have sort of described it like this, a piece of glass. And to get the R's high, you put a little film on it like that. You could do it that way. And basically, this is like a spectrometer, right? This only lets certain wavelengths go through. And you can tilt it to change the wavelengths because you can adjust the phase factor. You can also do it this way. You can have. Um, an air gap between two slides. You can have two pieces of glass and put your little film on them like this and have your light come in this way and go from air uh, glass to air uh, to glass. Right? You can also do it like this. You can have them really far apart and have a big region of space between them. Right? So all these different devices are used for different things and they all have different names. Right? So some of them are called etalons. You'll see it referred to as an etalon. You'll see it referred to as a Fabry-Perot interferometer. If you have a big space, it's usually called a resonant cavity. Right? And if you were to study these, you don't usually do R. You usually do T. Right? So instead of studying what reflects back, you study uh, big T, what gets through. Right? So if we looked at a more standard formula, for the transmittance of a resonant cavity or a fabry pro or whatever, it's 1 over 1 plus f sine squared delta over 2, where these are all pretty much uh, the same numbers, where f is uh, the finesse. It's either the finesse or the coefficient of finesse. I forget which one it is. Um, and that's 4r squared over 1 minus r squared quantity squared. So if you compare that to our, our r, this t to r, you'll see they're very similar. Right? But I just didn't bother to go through and calculate t. So anyway, there's a lot of uh, devices, again, it's called an etalon or a fabry perot And I'm also not describing them because if you want to learn about them, there are infinite descriptions of the fabry perot And I'm hoping now that you really understand them at this level, that you'll be able to read those descriptions and completely get any of these devices you need to know about. Another last thing I want to point out about these devices that have these sharp spectral features is they're actually kind of like our normal modes of the string. Okay, So if we were to look at the transmittance of one of these things, t versus wavelength, we were plotting r versus wavelength and we had a dip. For t versus wavelength, you have a spike. Right? We have to conserve energy. It looks something like that. Okay. So when you send light in, most of the light bounces back. It doesn't get through. But if it's one special wavelength, which we've now thought about, one where you get constructive interference um, across the cavity between the reflections here and the reflections here, <coughs> then it does go through because everything adds up. So that actually is also the place where you can kind of draw normal modes fitting inside the cavity. And they actually get you know, very large amplitudes. So if you have you know, an amplitude like this, the ones that are resonant, that's so what's called a resonant cavity, give you a huge amplitude inside, and then they keep going. So that's kind of trying to take it all the way back to the string. You can kind of think of this as finding the normal modes of the electromagnetic field in between these two surfaces.